Digital transformation is a huge hype. It sounds like something that classical companies do, these old classical companies. They start some projects, some initiatives, and at some point they're over this bridge and they're digitally transformed. So uh, you um, typically then, uh, when, you're, when you're done, you're doing things like uh, you're on the cloud, you have a web shop, you uh, are using no, no more legacy architectures, and you're using microservices and no SQL, and you got apps, and then you're digitally transformed. Well, Guilty has charged, so we, Metronome, we've uh, started such a transformation also four years ago, and uh, we've uh, had quite a journey, we've been learning a lot, and uh, some of the insights that we have been getting, I'm happy to be sharing with you today. So who are we? We're Metronome, we're Metro's tech unit, so we, are met we at Metronome, the tech unit, we're 2,000 people. Uh, we're mostly a product organization, an agile product organization, and we develop a whole bunch of products for our customers, end customers, and for our employees. So we're Metro's tech unit. What's Metro? Metro, you probably know under the brands of Metro and Macro in most of the countries, where we are a wholesaler. We sell B2B, mostly to restaurants and to hotels. So even if you have not been as part of a business into one of our stores, you've probably been to a restaurant where you ate food, where the ingredients were from Metro. And uh, we also operate under some uh, other, uh, other brands in, uh, in some other countries. So back to the tech unit, we at Metronome we're, Metronome, we're based in Dusseldorf. Most of the people are in Dusseldorf. We got a whole bunch of people, around 1,000 people in, uh, in Bucharest, which is our second, second uh, biggest, uh, biggest office. And uh, we also started an office in Berlin around last year, which is growing quite fast. And recently, we also opened, uh, opened up an office in Shanghai because we found out that our metro business in China is so special and the market is so, so special there and the speed is different. Therefore, we decided to have a dedicated IT office in Shanghai for our Chinese business. So it kind of sounds straightforward when you talk about digital transformation. And uh, so our journey has been nothing but that. We've had uh, quite a lot of uh, turns and ups and upside downs, uh, uh, ups and downs. And uh, I categorize most of those experiences that I would like to share with you here in three areas. One of them is technology. The other one is agility or business agility. And the other one is culture. Starting with technology. Uh, we. When we started this, we were very strict with the technologies that we use. We were of the opinion that whatever technology that we use, it has to be obviously scalable. It has to be the ones that we are approving as part of our digital transformation. And that meant like uh, new projects are start starting with microservices. Like database has to be no SQL. It has to be scalable. And uh, we were quite religious and strict with that. Uh, what has happened over the years is that we've ha had a lot of discussions on how religious we should be about that, how much, how important really the choice of technology or the use of choice of tool is, versus other things such as uh, really being uh, having business agility and having a strategy and having the right people working on something. We've had a lot of these discussions and things have changed a little bit. Discussions are still there, but some of the changes are, for example, that we now uh, we, we started with a custom-built web shop uh, based on microservices four years ago. It's quite successfully used in a lot of countries. We have a lot of sales uh, through that. Uh, but we're also um, we did it for another use case where we wanted to web shop also shop with, uh, with uh, another uh, uh, um, so solution, Spriker, um, and this was something maybe that we would have not done in the beginning, but we are now open to that. We also offer, for example, relational databases to, to our product teams that see a use case for that. So things have changed a little bit. There was also another presentation to the uh, uh, panel uh, before lunch um, uh, in uh, room three where the discussion was really the shop system that you use, how important this is, and I think this has some similarities to that, to the point that I try to make here. So be aware of uh, what, what you build, what, what you really need from what you're building. So in a, in a lot of the cases, I think we, we are not keeping that in mind and we build something that at the end is, is not really needed. When you start with this digital transformation, you have people and budget assigned to it. It might be quite easy to quickly that you jump into saying, okay, this we do, you know, full scale. Um, one of the examples that I have about this is that when we started, we built this shop system and we built also this fulfillment system. So the shop system, the customers are working with that. The traffic can be unpredictable. 
and it sends the orders to the fulfillment system where the employees are fulfilling the, the orders. And obviously that fulfillment system used by, by employees, so that is kind of predictable. But the tech stack that we used was, was the same for both of them. And uh, they were kind of going like uh, on, the same, on the same setup forward. And thinking back, was that needed? Probably not. And are there more cases where we should have been more diligent about uh, what, what we are really building? Probably yes. So something where going back might have probably uh, paid more attention to such, uh, such questions. So, you know, um, there are Amazons and Googles who are building quite a lot, or building maybe everything. Uh, probably not everything, but quite a lot. But uh, we were also of the mindset that a lot of the things we have to build ourselves. We have to build ourselves. It has to be a perfect fit to our business. This is something that we're also questioning a lot more uh, because we see an issue of focus. You do too much. You obviously have less focus. Focusing on the things that are really essential to the business. One area that I can think of where we have made some investment have been, for example, a PIM. Um, whereas, uh, you know, this, this PIM example or, or a merchandising system example, I think it's, it's quite a famous one. There's a famous German retailer who spent a lot of money trying to customize an existing system, uh, a merchandising system, and uh, that didn't really go somewhere. So whether you should build something yourself which fits perfectly, or you buy something, you customize it, or you change your processes to fit that. These are really questions, difficult questions, and uh, active questions, so there's no really good answer to that. But our tendency is to really be careful with the stuff that we try to build ourselves, and uh, really focus on things that are a core asset to our business. Scaling through verticals. Once you want to scale, you know verticalization is a really good approach. So with verticalization, I mean we have verticals, product teams are kind of like verticals. They control their whole stack so that they can be independent, so that they can be fast. And, and um, the, the approach is really good, but in some cases it can be a little bit complicated. So if you've got multiple verticals, for example, working on the same solution, let's say you've got a shop system, you got 20 developers working on it. You got four verticals of five developers each. They are working ultimately on the same solution. For customers, it's one product. And so this dependency management on features that are overlapping, this can be hard to manage. And we have exper experienced that. Um, another issue is uh, that you have to be aware of the costs of verticalization. How much redundancy are you willing to accept uh, when you are doing verticalization? Questions like, uh, if I have to have everything, all the data I need for my own vertical imported, or am I going to consume it from somewhere else except the SLOs? These are some of the questions that uh, we have uh, been really busy with discussing, and um, there's also not a good, really good answer to that. Principles. Um, when we started, we defined a set of principles. We said we're doing this transformation. This is the new digital world, and these are the principles for it. Everything has to be according to these principles. So it's fine, but the thing is that when you start with these principles, typically a central group of people who are very knowledgeable, experienced, architects, developers, that are defining these principles, what you need to have is uh, obviously the buy-in of the organization to, to uh, adopt these principles. And uh, you need to uh, make sure that the principles are pragmatic enough. That are you, how religious are you, how strict are you with these principles? So we have loosened up our principles, and we have also come up with ways to have more buy-in from the organization. We've come up with some ways and processes to have this uh, buy-in increased. So for example, we now encourage uh, people to come up with RFCs. If you want to propose a standard, you can write up an RFC and ask for comment from uh, other developers, architects within the company, and uh, refine that, and that can become a standard that has more buy-in. We uh, started uh, a tech radar, which was an idea we got with one of our partners, ThoughtWorks. And uh, the tech radar meant that uh, we recommend to the whole company, and this is also bottom-up, so all the uh, developers and architects have a chance to uh, participate in that. What are the technologies that we recommend? So we want to tell you Java we recommend, and for example, uh, COBOL we don't recommend because of these reasons. So something community-driven like that. So open it up and have more buy-in. So agility, agility comes with that, with the, with the transformation. A very important part of it, everybody wants to be agile, no question about that. <clears throat> what we experience is that in our setup, 
agility is really difficult. Because as I mentioned, we're in all these different countries, and uh, the countries are ranging from Portugal to Japan, so you can imagine completely different markets, different culture, different things that they are asking for us. So obviously we have to provide a lot of localization possibilities of our software so that it works everywhere, um, but it's also difficult to manage. We um, have a hard time at uh, you know, constantly trying to find out what we pr prioritize and what we do and how we do it in this setup. And what we want to do is that we want to empower our product teams to drive the product, so to be in the driver's seat. And um, so who knows the hippo? Hippo? A couple of people? So the highest paid person's opinion is something that was very important at the company. And uh, we want that to be less important and we want other things to be more important. So what are ways that you can actually do that? So going away from personal opinions into really data. And uh, so let's be fact-based, make the data your source of truth. What that means, it means that you have to have the right culture. We've been really pushing things like KPIs, like uh, act making it mandatory for product teams to define their set of KPIs, if, or at least to start with a North Star KPI using which we can see what is that number from your product that we have to be improving. Um, we've invested quite a lot in uh, introducing A-B testing in some of our uh, environments where it was maybe technically a little bit difficult to do, but uh, we've made that investment. Um, making changes in the infrastructure that we offer, moving to Google, using tools like BigQuery, Data Studio, giving access to the product teams, giving access to our countries and liberating that access as much as possible. Um, we're dealing with things like how we can uh, ensure security and privacy of the data when we are like liberating it within the company. These are some of the topics that we have to solve, but uh, this is the direction that we have to go. So in our, in our area to operate, we see data as a real necessity to go forward. Working with our stakeholders, again, the discussion of uh, what we want our stakeholders to be asking us. Asking us. We don't want them to tell us the output that they want. I don't want to hear that I want this feature like this, and it has to be this color, and it has to be like that, and it has to be this size. I want to know what is the business outcome you want to reach. And tell me that I want to increase sales, or tell me that I want to increase uh, uh, the conversion uh, by, by so many percent. And we have to look into how we can do that. And we use obviously experimentation, talking to customers, data to be able to achieve that. And that is also a mindset, big mindset shift that we are still going through. OKRs probably quite familiar with everybody. Somebody not familiar with OKRs? So one person, OK. <laughs> then I can stay on the slide. Um, so. A way to really focus on the objectives that you want to um, be uh, working on. Define a set of objectives, attach some key results so you can measure how you did on those objectives and focus on those for, for, for a given time. And uh, the OKR approach is, is quite cool. If you're at a startup, you can do it. If you're with a really start, small team, you can do it. It's quite straightforward. But how do you scale it throughout a bigger company like, uh, like we are? We've really struggled with that. And uh, this is um, how we are now doing it. So we are actually in one of the first iterations to try this out. And here you can see um, that we have an overall company objective, which is be the leading food delivery player. So that's across the whole group, across all the countries. And then we got from Poland an objective, which is in the strategy of our Polish organization, to make food delivery profitable, which is feeding into this overall company objective. We've got something similar for France, and they have key results attached to it, what they want to really reach in terms of the result in a given time. This is our company uh, objective, which is uh, maybe less business, has less of a business um, uh, definition like as the country ones, so we want to deliver great products. And obviously, this one uh, then feeds into the business um, objectives, drive sales more through our, uh, through our web shop. So this is the way that we want to be sure that we are contributing to the company and to the country objectives with what we are doing. So the third pillar or the third category where I want to share the insights that we had is culture. Um, this is something that for you know classical organization, cl these conglomerates that have been around for a while and offline, quite a big thing. 
And when we started with this transformation like uh, three, four years ago, we had this core team. We had this core team that started with this, some people with the right mindset, with the right skill set, to make sure that it is starting in the right direction and with the right speed, which I think is a, is a great approach. But then at some point, this team is growing and growing, and then they achieve some milestones, they get some more recognition, and then you got the company as a whole, people that are not part of this core team, wondering, okay, where are we? Is this like kind of the old world versus the new world? So we reached, that, we reached this point, and I think we were quite in time uh, about do, with doing something about it. So what we did was that we did kind of reorganization. This core team that had started, we, uh, took, we merged, merged them with the, with the existing departments. So we put these people in the departments that were responsible for the capabilities that they were working on and then we had a new organization. As you can imagine, this can be kind of turbulent. Any kind of reorganization is, uh, is a tricky thing. People take that very seriously. There is a mix of maybe cultures, of people from different uh, mindsets, ages, and this is hard to manage. And uh, to be honest, this is something that is ongoing. But we have had some measures to be able to, to do something about that and to work on that. One of the things that we, one of those measures, was uh, team tenants. We required all of the teams, all of the product teams, to pr produce their important tenants. And uh, you can see that some of them have to do with, with values. For example, in our team, respect and trust uh, is, is, uh, is key, and, uh, we, uh, and feedback, voicing our concerns. But you can also see that this tenant, for example, it says, the install, something about the install registration process. So this is what this team is doing. They're working on the registration process. That's their main thing. And for them, within that registration process, simplicity and speed is the most important thing. So if there are discussions about that, if they want to do another feature where they have a discussion or disagreement, hopefully they can refer to these tenets and have some guidance as where, where, they, where they want to go and answer some of those questions. We also invested quite a bit in defining our values. You see three values here. We have six of them. So these were like bottom-up, driven, voted by the company. And uh, what we are doing with them, I mean, we have them, which is quite nice. They're on some page somewhere. But um, uh, so within our hiring process, we are paying a lot, a lot of attention to these values. So teamwork has been the number one value. And if you're an engineering manager, for example, and you interview a software developer, and the software developer is a genius, you're like absolutely convinced. Uh, we have established a role which is like a hiring champ. It's completely independent. And the hiring champ has been trained to interview candidates based on values. And if the hiring champ says, I'm not convinced of this candidate's values, but like teamwork, then we are not going to hire you, even if you're the best uh, developer in the world. So, kind of black and white, but this is the idea that uh, we are paying a lot of attention to that. So, here you can see some of the faces of Metronome, and uh, so, so quite uh, uh, a mix of people looking very similar, and the idea is that we uh, start a bunch of initiatives, uh, start uh, defining some of the main strategies uh, that we want to have. So, we set up work groups with gr groups of people, ask them for three months to work on how they want to drive that specific strategy when it comes to, for example, one of them was culture, methodology, uh, portfolio management. We've, we had around, I think, a dozen of them. And uh, they presented the results and they handed the, them over or they continued working on it and driving it forward. So kind of like bottom-up involving uh, the company in those initiatives. And obviously feedback. I'm not familiar who's, if anybody knows, uh, is familiar with Pecan? So this is uh, so one, one person at least. But it's a feedback tool. It's an anonymous feedback tool. So here you can see that if I log in, for example, as a manager, I can see what the engagement score is of my team, how they are um, engaged with the company. And uh, we are sending them a bunch of questions that they can anonymously answer. And uh, questions can be categorized. For example, here you can see that the questions that we're asking how autonomous they feel like uh, for this manager who is looking at the dashboard is quite high, so 9.5. So this manager can say, yeah, in my team, uh, people feel really autonomous, and that's a good thing. They are really happy about that. And they can provide anonymous feedback uh, like this. So as a manager, I can uh, see the text feedbacks, and sometimes they are sending, for example, a zero if they're not happy with something and writing a really harsh comment. And you can engage with them and ask them, okay, how can I help fix that? 
um, or you get a lot of positive feedback. You know what what is working well and what is uh, what is it that you have to continue. So this has been really essential for us. We started with this kind of like an experiment, but it's now used throughout the company, and uh, I don't think it will be going anywhere because it's now an essential tool for us as the management to understand what's going on in the company, what are the what is the feedback, uh, real feedback that people can share anonymously with us at, at all times. Uh, roles and compensation, so uh, we have been around for quite some time, so we had this complex role structure and grading structure, and we, have a, we felt that we have to do something about this. We want to be a new company, we want to be a digital company, but our role structure is not really showing that. So, came up with new roles uh, that fit the existing structure, and uh, also looked at compensation for these roles. Compens we took grading away, so we took seniority level, like junior, uh, mid-year, senior away. We said, we don't want to have that in your title. Obviously, the, the salary uh, range uh, is quite wide. We don't want to have that in title. We're introducing uh, tools like 360 Feedback, and uh, we also have conducted salary studies to make sure that we are uh, paying our employees what we should be paying them. Uh, something we did last year, something we will do again this year, and hopefully can be continued doing and making sure that we are checking that at all times. So this one you don't have to do necessarily. Maybe this one is a bit extreme, a complete rebranding and renaming of your company. <laughs> but this is uh, uh, something that we did. So we were Metro Systems. Uh, now we are Metronome. So we are operating under, under, under a new brand, uh, under a unified brand that um, is fitting uh, what we, what we, the changes that we have made internally and what we want to be to the outside world. So if you would say, uh, uh, how has the journey been? I, I, I think we're, we're still in the journey. I don't know if we will reach the end of it. Uh, we've had quite a lot of uh, challenges on the way. So digital transformation is for sure a hype. Um, but I think our experiences has shown us that it's been something that we had to do and uh, definitely uh, worth it for us. Happy to take questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. First of all, um, you talked about the buy-in at your first slide of uh, first of the slides. How did you convince your management that uh, they have to buy in into your digital strategy? Uh, you mean at the start of the transformation? Exactly. Actually, at the, the start of the transformation, we had great support from management because we had actually created the, uh, the, the setup and the structure with the management to do exactly this. So we had a lot of support for that. And uh, that meant that we could go really fast and be disruptive. Because we had management support, we had the confidence to go ahead with it. Otherwise, I think there would have been a lot of pushbacks. So we saw that as necessary. Um, it also meant that... Uh, you know, we had to. Uh, uh, we we didn't maybe necessarily ha uh, hear all the all the feedbacks that we had to hear because people were just letting us uh, do what we what we are uh, commissioned to do, and uh, not opposing us because we have really strong backing. You know, so so I'm saying that it could have been a, a more open environment. So the, the strong management backing pushed it forward no matter what. Um, and that might have uh, sidelined some of the other opinions, but management backing was there because this was considered as something we have to do. So what we said a lot was like digital or die, <laughs> what our management was saying. So that was clear. That's a clear statement. Thank you. All right, sounds like no more questions. Then, thank you.